there's a, an old story about a man who fell in a ditch. And unfortunately for this man, he couldn't get up out of the ditch. Not long after he had fallen in, there's another man that walked by. This man was a, a realist. And the realist looked at the man in the ditch and said, you've fallen into a ditch before he continued on walking. Not much later, an optimist came by, saw the man and said, don't worry, things are going to get a whole lot better before he too kept walking. Next came a pessimist and said, oh, things are going to get a whole lot worse, continued on. Then came a newspaper reporter and said, oh, can I write an exclusive story on your life in the ditch? Didn't get an answer, so on they went. Then came a CRA agent, and they were asking for the man to pay taxes for his life in the ditch. You get the point, on and on and on it goes. No one helps the man. But then, God comes. God comes by the ditch, sees the man, offers the man his hand, and lifts the man up out of the ditch, dusts him off, and makes sure that the man is okay. This is a picture of God reaching out to the lowly, to the humble places, to show his mercy and his compassion. And it's this mercy and this compassion of God to the lowly that's on display in our text today in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. And this passage is also the first of four songs that we see in the book of Luke surrounding the time of the birth of Jesus. And this song that Mary sings begins with jubilant praise for the Lord. As she says, starting in verse 46, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This is, this is pretty upright praise. She's clearly extremely joyful. She's, she's in awe of what God has done. But we need to ask the question, why is Mary praising God so joyfully? Why does her soul magnify the Lord like this? And it's the rest of the psalm that gives us the reason for Mary's praise. And we see that Mary sings a magnifying melody to God because in his rich mercy, he humbles the proud and exalts the humbled. And this is revealed first in God's mercy that he shows to Mary, which we see in verse 48 and 49. This is what Mary says. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So according to this song that Mary's singing, God considers Mary to be a woman of humility, a woman of humble estate. She says it herself. And we know that this uh, is true based on several little tidbits that we get throughout the Christmas story. For instance, if we go back to chapter 1, verse 26, we see this little tiny piece of information, but it's actually very important. Verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And Nazareth is where Mary was from. Now, Nazareth was, to put it frankly, a nothing town. No one cared about Nazareth. And I know a little something about it uh, being from a nothing town. If any of you have ever asked me, I've probably told you that I'm from Priestville, Saskatchewan, which is only partially true. That's where I went to school. That's where uh, I played my sports, so on and so forth. But in reality, my parents' farm is much closer to a tiny little town called Okla. And I wouldn't say I'm ashamed of being from Okla, but maybe a little bit, you know, because it, it is just like it's a, it's a nothing town. No one cares or thinks twice about Okla. And the same was really true of, of Nazareth. It was a forgotten, nothing, looked down upon town in the uncared about region of Galilee. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 46, we read the common idea that people had when it came to Nazareth. As a man asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's the common idea. And in fact, in, in the Old Testament, if you read the entire Old Testament, you see tons of towns listed, tons of, of cities listed. Not once is Nazareth mentioned in the entire Old Testament. It was really just this, this nothing humble town. But that's where Mary was from. Those were her roots. She's from Nazareth. She was a Nazarene, a simple young girl from a simple nothing town. It wasn't the big city, wasn't anything glamorous, 
just a humble town called Nazareth. And this shows that Mary had this humble beginning. But this isn't the only reason that Mary might be considered humble. She also has a heart that is humble before God. Consider how Mary responds when the angel tells her that she would have a son conceived of the Holy Spirit. In verse 38, we see Mary's response to this news. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Well, Mary could have said an awful lot of, of, of things when she hears this news. She could have freaked out. Probably would have been the natural thing to do. She could have responded in doubt and said, this will never happen to me. That's what Zechariah did earlier on in Luke chapter 1. Or she could have become puffed up and said, yeah, this makes sense. I, I probably should be the one to bring the Lord into the world. I'm quite something. But she doesn't respond like that at all. Instead, what she does is responds with unbelievable humility. Basically, she says there in verse 38, God, I'm your servant, so your will be done. If, if this is what you want for me, I'm willing. Right? There's, there's no self-exaltation. There's no look at me. It's just willing service to her God. I think that's a telling snapshot of Mary's heart in that moment, her humble heart. We get a deeper look at Mary's heart of humility in the actual song that she sings as well. As throughout, we see all she's doing is praising and exalting God because of what he has done. As she says in verse 49, you know, he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And we see this exaltation of God happen throughout this entire song that she sings. She doesn't sing about herself. She's not exalting herself. She's only exalting God. She recognizes, really, she's nothing special. God just happened to choose her. And so she was going to exalt God and not exalt herself. So we see that Mary is both from a physically humble estate, but also has these humble spiritual, a humble spiritual heart inside of her as well. But we see that due to this humility that Mary shows, that Mary has, God reveals his mercy and blesses Mary greatly. Verse 48 here in, in Mary's song says that God looked upon the humble estate of his servant. Uh, some, some translations have a different word there. It says that the, uh, God regarded Mary. That means that God was mindful of Mary. When he looked at Mary, he looked on her with favor because of the humility that she had. And, and that's really interesting. It, it specifically says that God looked on her with favor because of her humble estate. So God showed his mercy to Mary because she was humble. And it's interesting because God really could have chosen any Israelite woman to bring Jesus into the, into the world. But he chose Mary. He could have chose someone from any walk of life, from really any town. But he regarded Mary. He showed his mercy to her, looked on her with favor. And because of that favor that God shows Mary, it says that all generations would call Mary blessed. And that's a really interesting verse, the fact that all generations would call Mary blessed because uh, for, for many years in Roman Catholicism, that verse has been used to support uh, the praise or, or prayers to, to Mary. You know, it says that we're supposed to bless Mary, doesn't it? Well, not quite. It simply says that when we look back, all the generations can look back and say, yeah, Mary was a very blessed woman. She got to bring the Lord Jesus into the world. And it's true that generations and generations of Christians have looked back and said that because she was the one that got that amazing privilege of, of bearing and giving birth to the Savior of the world. She was blessed to be the mother of the Messiah. And she knows she's blessed. And she's not the only one that knows this. Her, her, uh, her cousin, Elizabeth, knows as much as well. As we read in verse 42 and 43, Elizabeth says this to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? Elizabeth says, Mary, you are blessed 
because you are the mother of my Lord. Can you imagine hearing that? Someone saying, you're blessed because you're carrying the Lord in you, in your womb. Like that truly is the most amazing blessing that Mary could have ever received. And she received that because God looked on her with favor as she was from a lowly estate, both physically and spiritually. There was a man who once said this. He said, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves one above the other, and that the taller we grew in godly character, the easier we could reach these gifts. I now find that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath the other, that it's not a question of growing taller, but stooping lower, and that we have to go down, always down, to get the best gifts. I think that's a wonderful illustration of the blessings that the humble receive. And that's certainly what Mary experienced. As she went down, as she humbled herself, she received great blessing from God. As she said, the mighty one had shown mercy on her and done great things for his hum- uh, for her humble for his humble servant. As we continue on in Mary's song, we see not only does God show his mercy to Mary, but he also shows his mercy to all who fear him. Verse 50 through 53. His mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. So once again here, we see an example of humility on display in this song, as it says that there are those who fear the Lord. And in order to fear the Lord, one must be humble. You can't think much of yourself and and still exalt God and still fear God. You must humble yourself in order to do that. And, And fearing the Lord is to revere God, to look at God in awe. Can you really do that if you're looking inward, if you're looking at yourself? I don't think you can. You must be humble. Isaiah 66 verse 2 alludes to this when it says, this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Well, here we see that, that idea of fearing the Lord, trembling at his word and a humble and contrite spirit come together. In order to fear the Lord, you must. In order to, um, to tremble at his word, you must be humble and contrite in spirit. And so we see this fear of God and humility completely interwoven as the one who trembles before God is also humble and contrite in heart. You can't be boastful and proud and still have right reverence and fear for God. To truly fear him, you need to have a humble and contrite heart like Mary displayed. So we see that example of spiritual humility here in these verses, verses 50 to 53. But Mary also speaks in this stanza of her song about physical humility. She specifically mentions those who are are poor and hungry. And we know that for those who are are poor and, and are hungry, they're examples of people who are of lesser circumstance than many people. They're of humble estate, of lowly estate. And so as Mary's singing this song, we need to realize that it seems like she has both the spiritually humble and to some extent the physically humble in mind. And she says to those who are humble physically or spiritually, in her day or past that, from generation to generation, all of them would receive God's mercy and God's blessing. And part of that blessing that is promised is that God will exalt the humble, will exalt the lowly, as it says in verse 52. And we see this exalting of the humble in so many places throughout the scriptures. You know, two people that come to mind right away are Hannah and David. Hannah was, was a barren woman, and she was mocked and maligned by a rival wife because her husband had her as a wife and another wife. And Hannah, unable to have children, the other wife had many children. And so Hannah felt absolutely beaten down. She felt defeated because of this mockery that she faced to the point that she couldn't even eat, for Samuel tells us. And so in this state that she was in, she was was absolutely humiliated. But what Hannah does is humble herself before God. 
She says in 1 Samuel 1 verse 11, as she cries out to, to God, she says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Notice there, she called herself a servant three times in that one short prayer. She's humbling herself, calling herself God's servant, and God heard her cry. And he had mercy on her. And ultimately, he exalted Hannah and gave her a son, whose name was Samuel. And later, that that boy Samuel grew to be a great prophet. And God used Samuel to anoint God's chosen king. The boy we know to be David. And David was, was a small boy, relatively unimpressive, just a shepherd boy, youngest in his family. His family was nothing that impressive. In fact, his, his grandma wasn't even a Jew. Why would, why would anyone pick this insignificant boy to be king? I'm sure many people were asking that question. David's brothers certainly were. But God said in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And God knew that David had a humble heart. So what did he do? He had mercy on David and lifted him up to be king. These examples of of Hannah and of David are amazing illustrations of God's mercy, how he exalts the humble. And those are just two illustrations of the many that we see throughout the scriptures of God having mercy and exalting the humble. But on the flip side of God's mercy, that's the positives. The flip side of God's mercy, we also read that, that God humbles the proud. In Luke 1, 51 here, it says that God scatters the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. And I think this verse is a really interesting revelation because it shows us that pride is a matter of the heart and not always a matter of what's on the outside. I think we're prone to think of a proud person as like that, that arrogant, obnoxious, boastful person that like you can just recognize right away. It's like, oh yeah, that's a proud person right there. But I think this is telling us it goes much deeper than that. I'm sure that person is proud. But the reality is the quiet and unassuming person might have more pride than the outwardly boastful person. Because pride is a heart issue. One who's unwilling to humble themselves and take account of God is proud. If you're not willing to do that, you're proud. And it says here that person that is proud, God will put down. God will scatter. So God humbles the proud. And in his mercy, he also says here that he topples the mighty ruler who oppresses those of humble estate. And he shames those who are self-satisfied and and seek after riches and fame rather than seeking after God. He humbles them. And as Mary is singing all of these words, she clearly is recognizing that God's mercy works so contrary to what us as humans are used to seeing. In, in, our, in our world. Because Mary knew, and we know, so often the rich get richer, the strong get stronger, and the proud are called confident and are granted all sorts of success. But we're told here, God doesn't work that way. God says that it's the poor and the beaten down. Those who, who willingly admit that they are impoverished, especially of their spiritual state, those who are willing to admit that will receive blessing. And that's, that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing example of God's mercy. There's a story of a proud lawyer who went to go uh, visit his brother, who was a farmer. And the lawyer shows up and says to his brother, the farmer, why don't you hold your head up high the way I do? No one pushes me around because I'm a somebody. I don't bow to anyone. God or man? Well, the farmer pointed to a field of grain and he said, see that field of grain over there? Only the empty heads stand up. Those that are well filled always bow low. You know, this is what God desired for his people Israel. It's what God desires for us as Christians today. He desires for us to be bowed low, to be filled, full, full, and receive the mercy of 
the Almighty God. You know, the, the proud around us might look like something, but in the end, we're told that they are sent away empty, that they are humbled. So up to this point, God has shown his mercy to Mary, to those who fear him, and now we're going to see in these final two verses of our text that Mary bears witness to God's mercy that he shows to the nation of Israel. Verse 54 and 55. She says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. We notice here again the the humble estate of Israel being alluded to as they're called God's servant, which implies humility. We saw that with Mary. She called herself God's servant. Uh, Hannah called herself God's servant three times. Now Israel is called the servant of God. And really, if you consider the history of Israel, you notice that much of Israel's history was pretty, pretty humble and in some ways pretty humiliating. Even the origin of Israel was from a humble state. You know, they originated from a 90-year-old barren woman and a 100-year-old man and Sarah and Abraham. The Bible tells us that uh, in certain places it says that people consider them to be as good as dead. You know, that's, that's how people considered Abraham and Sarah. That was, that was Israel's beginning. But from these two, God brought forth Isaac and then Jacob. And eventually, uh, Jacob became known as Israel and, and the nation of Israel ends up being born. That's a humble beginning. Now, throughout their history, of course, their power and humility ebbed and flowed for sure. But at the time that Mary sang this song, Israel was in one of those particularly humble states. They were ruled by the empire of Rome as the Romans had Israel under their thumb and lorded their power over the Jews. And the Jews had their king, if you could call him that, in Herod. But Herod did essentially nothing to help the common people of Israel. So this left the people helpless when it came to matters of justice and and civil rights and it caused them to be discouraged, caused them to be downtrodden. So all things considered, the nation was in a humbling and rather destitute situation in Mary's day. However, in the midst of these humbling circumstances facing Israel, it says that God remembers his mercy. Just as it happened so many other times throughout Israel's history, God would help his people. He would show his care and his compassion for them because God was committed to showing his mercy to Israel because of the covenant he had made so many years before to their forefather, Abraham. And that that covenant is alluded to, is, is referenced in Genesis chapter 12 is where we read about that. Genesis chapter 12, verses two to four. I'll just read that for a little bit of context. It says this, And I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What we read there is God covenanting with Abraham. Making a promise to him. And part of that promise was to provide blessing for his people Israel forever. And one aspect of that blessing God had promised Abraham was understood to be the coming of the Savior, the coming of the Messiah for the Israelite people. And and in Mary's day, Israel felt the need to be saved because Rome was over them. They were looking for the Savior. Now, for the most part, they were looking for only a physical Savior, not so much a spiritual Savior. Not all of them, but most. But in reality, the Messiah was coming to bring more than just the physical salvation. He was also coming to bring a spiritual salvation. That's, what the, that's what ultimately what the Messiah came to bring in the first coming. As we read in Matthew 1 verse 21, it says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Spiritual salvation. That's what God was providing And that's what the people of Israel needed so desperately. And Mary seems to understand here as she sings this song that the child in her womb, Jesus, was the one who would bring that salvation. She knows that this baby inside of her is the fulfillment of that covenant promise as she sings about the fact that her son would be the blessing that God had, had covenanted with Abraham. 
Mary recognized that God was faithful. He had sent Israel's long-awaited Messiah in remembrance of his mercy. She knew that God would never forget his people. And what an amazing blessing Mary received as well by getting to have a part in this display of God's mercy for her people. I'm sure she was just overwhelmed with joy at the fact that I get to play a part in God rescuing my people, in God bringing this this salvation. Now, it's no wonder that Mary responds to all of this blessing, to, to all of this mercy by praising God, by saying, my spirit rejoices in the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. And so Mary sings. And she does. She magnifies God because she had known and experienced the mercy of God in abundance and in unbelievable ways. She'd seen this mercy in her own life. She'd seen it in the lives of those who fear him. And she'd even now seen it in the nation of Israel. Mary knew without a doubt that God's mercy was great, particularly uh, for those who humbled themselves before God. For the humble one is the one that God exalts, and the proud is the one that God humbles. Now, interestingly, this idea of, of humility and exaltation really permeates the entire Christmas story. It's not just in this song that Mary sings that we see this humility at play. As we know, God the Son humbled himself. He left heaven, came to earth as a boy, born and placed in a feeding trough, of all things. And he came not just to to be a man, but Philippians 2 tells us he came to be a servant. And not just a servant, but a servant who's willing to die. And not just a servant who will die, but will die the worst death we could imagine. Death on a cross. For our sins. And what's the result of all that humility that God the Son shows? Philippians 2 verse 9 says, the result is this. Therefore, God has exalted him. This exaltation. God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The great humiliation of Jesus Christ results in the greatest exaltation we could ever imagine. That every knee, every knee would bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when we consider this example, this amazing example of Christ's humility, when we, uh, when we think of the example of the humility we saw with Mary as well, we too ought to think that we should humble ourselves. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 tells us to do so. It says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. There's a command here in the scripture to humble ourselves. And if we want to do that, I think we would do well to follow the pattern that that Mary lays out for us in our text today. Because as I mentioned before, Mary did not exalt herself. She had the opportunity to. She had the platform to. She so easily could have arrogantly said, look at me, I'm the mother of God, I'm a big shot. She didn't. She didn't exalt herself. I'm sure she probably felt that temptation to, considering that she was the mother of the Lord Jesus. She didn't. You know, I think we so often face a similar temptation, a temptation to exalt ourselves. I know, if I'm being honest, I certainly do. And as I was thinking about this, lots of times at, at Christmas, you know, we get together with our families and, and stories start getting exchanged. We all know how that works. One person shares a story. It's a pretty good story. Then the next person shares a story to one-up the last one. And then another person shares a story to one-up the last one. Maybe that's just the way we tell stories. I'm not sure. But I think sometimes that's because we're trying to exalt ourselves. We try to put down whoever it is that just told that story. It's like, oh, you think that's good? Well, I'm better. I've got, I've got one up on you, right? And we exalt ourselves. I think that's a temptation we might face. But is that what we should do? This is just one example. Of course, there's many other times in life where we might exalt ourselves, that we might think it's more serious. But I think that is a serious example where we do tend to exalt ourselves. I think we would do well to avoid that temptation to lift ourselves up, to exalt ourselves, and rather humble ourselves, just like God's servant Mary did. 
And we recognize that Mary also humbly accepted what God had called her to do. She said, let it be to me according to your word. In other words, she basically said to God, your will be done. And you know, it takes an awful lot of humility to say those words, to say, God, your will be done. But Mary was able to say those words because her focus wasn't on herself. Her focus was on God's plans, on God's purposes. And she sought to think, to praise, and to live in light of those purposes that God had for her. And that's hard to do. You know what? It's, it's far easier for me to see, say, my will be done than thy will be done. It's way easier to focus on my plans and my purposes than to think about God's plans and his purposes. I think that's, that's probably true for all of us at times. But what humility does when we humble ourselves before God, we put our thoughts, we put our desires aside. I'm sure Mary wasn't thinking about being uh, pregnant before she was married. I'm sure that wasn't part of her plan. But she was willing to put that aside and say, God, your will be done. Humility looks like submissive obedience to God's will. And so, I want us to think about this today. Is this humility something that we as a church are pursuing? Are we pursuing to obey God's will? Are we pursuing to exalt him and not exalt ourselves? Are we willing to say, God, whatever your plan and your purpose is for me, for our church, I will do it because your will be done. I hope that we're pursuing this type of attitude where we're able to put ourself aside. We're able to humble ourselves in obedience to God. I hope that we're able to say, God, let it be according to your word. Because as we know, it's, it's the humble that God shows his mercy to, that God exalts. And it's the proud that he chooses to humble. So I think we would do well to pray and to ask God to grow us as a church in humility together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great mercy that you have shown to us, that you've shown to so many people in history, the many examples that we saw of that today. Lord, we thank you that in your mercy, you bless the meek, you bless the lesser, you bless the humble. And with that in mind today, we pray that, that we would seek as a church to grow in humility. Lord, that we wouldn't exalt ourselves, that we would not live for our plans or for our purposes, but that we would rather exalt you, that we would walk humbly before you as we ought to. God, help us to, to grow in this and to remember the amazing humility that your son Jesus showed when he came to earth. And we know that Philippians tells us to model, that that was a model for us to follow. So I do pray, Lord, that you would help us humble ourselves. If the God of the universe can humble himself, certainly we too can do so with the help of your spirit. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to do that. And we pray these things now in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.